Hey, what's up? My name's Kevin. I'm the pastor right here at the church, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, here at the church, we have three different campuses that gather on a weekly basis. We have a campus in Visalia, California. We also have a church campus in Tillamook, Oregon. And we have a third campus, which you are on right now, which is our online campus. And so whether you're watching from California, Oregon, or anywhere in the United States or the world for that matter, we just want to say thank you so much for joining us. We're currently in a series simply titled Acts, and we are going through the book of Acts one chapter at a time. So thank you so much for joining us. Grab a Bible, grab a notebook, and let's get ready to grow. We're going to be reading in the book of Acts, but before we get there, I want to read a passage out of Matthew chapter 5, and you guys are familiar with it if you've been in church. It's Jesus' words, and Jesus is saying about us as his believers and his followers, he's saying that you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is a passage of Scripture that Jesus was saying to a group of people on a hillside. But it's a passage of Scripture that applies to you as a Christ follower today. Many times in our life, we wonder, who am I, and what am I here for, and what can I do, and I don't understand my purpose. God already knows your purpose. This is your purpose. You are the salt of the earth. You, you are the salt of the earth. You were made and placed in your cul-de-sac, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your family. You were made to do what salt does to food, to preserve it. You, that's why you're here. You are here to make the life taste better. You're here because you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are a city that is set up on a hill, and you cannot hide. You can try and hide if you want. But if you do good things, people are going to notice. If you do dumb things, people are going to notice. You can't hide. This is who you are. You are salt. You are light. You are a city. And what I want to talk about today is I'm, so, I'm very excited about the topic today and the message today because the, 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 the main point that I want to get across today is this, is that Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for you, yes you, for you to be mediocre. He did not die on the cross for you to have an average life, an average marriage, uh, average finances, uh, average business, uh, average, he, he did not die for you to have average influence, he died on the cross for you to be a light to the world. That doesn't mean you're going to be rolling in the dough and having a yacht and a big old fancy car going down the road. And I, I, I like that. I'm talking about you know, riding high by the world standards. I'm talking about being an influencer. That whenever you leave this earth, people around you will remember what you did for them. That's who God has designed you to be. He didn't die on the cross for you to be mediocre. He died for you to be a light, to be a salt, to be, city, to be a city on a hill. And today what we're going to do is, is we're going to look at Acts chapter 28 as we wrap up this incredible book, looking at this last little part of the journey of the Apostle Paul. Where we left Paul last week uh, was a really cool day, and it was a really bad day. Uh, the ship got destroyed, uh, but everybody was saved, and now Paul is, is now on an island known as Malta. And that's where we pick up Paul. He's on his way to Rome. We're about, for this point, maybe two and a half years ago, I'm kind of guessing, I know it was at least two plus several months, probably two and a half years ago or so, Jesus said, you're going to go to Rome. And now Paul's on his way to Rome, but he's shipwrecked on an island known as Malta, which is not Rome, but he's on his way. And what we're going to do today is, is we're going to read a section, look at Paul's life, apply it to us. Look at Paul's life, apply it to us. But before I get into this, I, I want you... Um, this is how I want to encourage you to listen to this message today. Number one is it's get out a notebook, get out a pen, get out uh, something to write on. Go back and watch this again online. But what I want you to do is as you're listening to Paul's life and as you're listening to how we're applying it, what I want you to do today is you need to filter. I want you to filter the points that we're making today 
I want you to filter them on your own into your life. So as you're listening to this, if you own a business, you're going to be able to filter the words we're talking about through you now as a businessman or a businesswoman. If you are a school teacher, you'll be able to filter this. I want you to filter this through the influence you have in children. If you are a stay-at-home mom, filter this through that. If you are a father, a mother, a person who's retired, whatever you are, whatever God has placed you in, you listen to these points today and you filter the thoughts into your life in hopes that you would become the city on a hill, that you would become the light, that you would become a salt to the people around you. And so I love Acts 28. I absolutely love it. It is so, it's a cool story, but it is so practical. So here we go. Acts 28, starting at verse number one. It says, and once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all. It was raining and cold. Paul gathered a pile of brushwood and as he put it on the, on the fire, a viper, a snake, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. And when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer, for though he ex- escaped from the sea, the just, justice has not excuse me, allowed him to live. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing no unusual thing happen to him, they believed now with their minds that he was a god. So here's what's going on. Paul lands in the island of Malta. Now, when I'm I'm reading Acts 27 and I see that they ran the ship ashore on on an island, I'm thinking like an island like Gilligan's Island, where, you know, there's no one there. There's maybe a couple crazy natives. That's about it, you know, but there's nobody in the island. That's not the case. There was, as you're seeing in a minute, there, there was people there. There was, there, there was a city there. They just happened to land on a place that was a, you know, an island. And as they land, the people of, the, of Malta, they see that they're here and they're, they're, they, they like them. So they like the centurion soldiers. They, they like the apostle Paul. They think, man, it's so cool that the gods have saved you. And so, yes, c- come on in. And so they like Paul. Well, then Paul begins to make a fire. And as Paul's making a fire, he throws a piece of wood in. And as he throws a piece of wood in, a snake jumps out of the fire and bites his hand. Now, I'll just take a time out here. If I'm the Apostle Paul in a relationship with God, about this time, I'm thinking, really? Come on. You said I'm going to go to Rome. Then you put me there for two years. Then I get on a ship, and it's shipwrecked. And now I get bit by a flipping snake. I mean, come on, man. And he just shakes the snake off, and nothing happens to him. But when the people see that Paul has a snake bite him, they think he's not good. He must be wicked. Because justice has now allowed him to be bit by a snake and die. So this man is wicked and evil. But then as they continue to watch him, they see that he doesn't swell up. He doesn't die. So now they've changed their minds and said, no, he's not wicked and evil. He's actually a god. So within about 25, maybe, you know, maybe one day, within about one day, these people see Paul and they say, I like you. Then they say, I don't like you. You're wicked. And then they say, I think I should worship you because you're a God. Okay. In one day, the people's viewpoint of the Apostle Paul changes from you're good to you're wicked to you're a God. And what I see in this is this. People's opinions about the Apostle Paul were very fickle. One day they liked him. The next day they didn't. One day they liked him. The next day they didn't. And you see this on the island of Malta, and you see this all throughout Paul's life. The opinions of man was constantly changing with Paul. And if you notice in Paul's life, he never played towards the opinions of men. He played for an audience of one. And if I'm pleasing God, I'm good. Because I know that their opinion and his opinion and her opinion of me is probably going to change by the end of the day. But I don't care what they think. I care what he thinks. Now, that's the Apostle Paul. But I think as a stay-at-home mom, 
I think as a business person, I think as a parent, as a grandparent, a, retire, a person who's retired, I think that no matter what stage or place in life you find yourself, this principle that we see in this story is very applicable to you today. And here's the point that we want to make and that I see out of this. People's opinion of you is always changing. They're very fickle. I like you. <laughs> I don't like you. You're my friend. Who are you again? They're returning text. Then they never return text again. Let's go out to dinner. I stabbed you in the back. And people are going to be in and out and up and down, like you a lot, kind of like you, don't like you anymore, now I like you again. People's opinion is always going to change. So because of that, the point that we want to grab a hold of today is, is don't let the approval of men be the motivation for your life. Don't let the approval of men be the motivation of your life. And before you say, it's, what are you talking about? I don't care what people are thinking about me, really. How many times a day do you check your Instagram account to see how many likes you got? How many times do you check your Facebook to see how many shares you had? How many times do you say to yourself, oh man, I got 18 likes this time, last time I only had seven. How many times? We do care. We really, really want someone's approval. We want them to like our picture. We want them to like our thing. We want them to like us. Um, I, had a, I had a dog one time named Buddy, and Buddy was a good dog, but he was also a bad dog, okay? But every, that's a whole other story. But Buddy, <laughs> but Buddy would consistently, consistently come up to me and come up against my leg and... <laughs> Like, pet me, pet me, pet me, pet me. And he'd push again, pet me, pet me. And then I'd say, I'd pet him a little bit, and then Buddy would do something dumb, and I'd yell at him, Buddy, come on, you're stupid. And he'd come right back up to me, pet me, pet me. It's okay, like me, like me. And if I was upset with Buddy, he wanted me to pet him. If I liked Buddy, he wanted me to pet him. Buddy was driven by, does my master like me? Does he like me? Will he pet me? Will he like me? He had to have my approval, Veronica's approval. Even when he did bad things, he would come back and, and isn't that how we are in our life? We, we want his approval. And many times it's the approval of men that drives us, and that's our motivation to purchase the car that we purchased. Because if I drive this kind of car, then I won't be as influ influential, and the people won't buy the stuff from me because they'll think I'm poor. If I drive that type of car, then I won't really fit in with the crew that I'm hanging with. And you remember back in junior high, there's the cool kids table? And, oh, God, we want to sit at the cool kids' table. It's, I want to sit at the cool kids' table. And many times we think as adults that that's a junior high thing. But that thing that happens in our heart in junior high, does this popular person like me? Does this popular person accept me? Does this popular person like me? That drives us even into adulthood. And it motivates us to purchase things. It motivates us to take certain jobs. It motivates us to say things. It motivates us that when we know we should confront we won't confront because we don't want them to be mad at us. But here's the good news and the bad news. They're going to be mad at you tomorrow anyway. They're going to love you today and be mad at you tomorrow. If you drive that car or if you don't. If you make that confrontational statement or if you don't. People will go up and they will go down with their gratification towards you. So because of that, don't let the eyes of men and the heart of men and the, 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 the pleasure of men be the driving force in your life. What should be the driving force of your life? Play to an audience of one. And the good news about God is, is God is not like a man that he should change his mind. And he loves you. And he died for you. And he accepts you. And he wants to make you better. And even when you mess up, he loves you. He died for you. He accepts you. And he wants to make you better. And even when you do good, he died for you. He loves you. He accepts you. And he wants to make you better. His opinion of you will never change. His calling and election is sure. So because of that, don't let the driving motivation of your life is, is what do they think about my clothes? What do they think about what I said? What do they think about what I do? What do they think? What do they think? What do they think? It doesn't matter what they think because whatever they think now, they will think something different in a week. And you will go crazy 
in your mind trying to please all of them. The good news is, is as a Christ follower, we don't have to please them. We please him. And he's our motivation. So that's the first thing that I see in this is don't let the approval of men be the driving motivation of your life. Work for an audience of one. What is right, what is godly, what is God-pleasing. And let that be your motivation in your business, in your family, in your parenting, in whatever stage of life that you're in. The second thing that we see, we're going to jump down to verse number 21. Excuse me, verse number 11. Now Paul, he's, he's left the island of Malta. He's getting ready to leave the island of Malta and get on a boat. And here's what it says. It says, after three months... We put out to sea in a ship that we went that, that that wintered in the island. It was an Alexandrian ship with a figurehead of twin gods of Castor and Pollux. We put in at Syracuse and stayed there for three days. From there we set sail and arrived at Rigium. The next day the south wind came up, and on the following day we reached uh, Putali. There we found some brothers who invited us to spend a week with them, and so we came to Rome. So now, finally, Paul's ship docks at Rome. Now, we read that and think, there is absolutely nothing that I can take from that passage of Scripture. He's in Malta. They, three months later, they get on an Alexandrian ship. They go to that town, this town. They stay here a week, and finally, they come to Rome. Several months ago, whenever I was reading this, there's one phrase that stuck out to me, and here's what it is. And after three months, after three months, okay, the Apostle Paul, two and a half years earlier, was told by Jesus, you're going to go to Rome. And then God set Paul in a house for two years. After the two years, he finally gets to start to go see another guy and see another guy. And now at about two and a half months, he gets on a boat. Then he gets shipwrecked on an island on his way to Rome. He's this close to Rome. And God says, wait here three months. Okay? That's June, July, August, and September he gets on the boat. He has to wait for three months. And it was after three months, the ship came, the weather cleared, and he meets friends and he goes on to Rome. In this three months, Paul never lost heart. He never lost focus. He never said, well, maybe I'll try and stay here. Maybe Rome's not going to work. He just did a very godly thing. He waited. He just waited. And then he waited. And he waited some more. And then God brought the ship. And when God brought the ship, he got on it. But up until that point, he just was patient. And whether you are a parent, a business person, a a Christian, no matter who you are, no matter what your field is, no matter what your field is, is you have got to learn this thing. It is God's call. It is God's vision. And it'll be done in God's time. And until then, just wait. Just wait. Because history is full of people who jacked their life up because they just couldn't wait. God comes to Abraham thousands of years before our time. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a son. And this son's going to be blessed. And you will have it through your wife, Sarah. And he waits. And he waits. And he waits, and he waits, and he says, I I can't wait anymore. I'm going to make my own baby. And so he goes and he sleeps with his his, uh, uh, um, servant, and he makes another son. And now we've got the whole thing of Israel, and we've got the whole thing of the Arabs. We've got all all of the wars in the Middle East have all come, literally, because Abraham couldn't wait. He had to take his pants off. He couldn't wait. He he, he had to make it happen myself. You said it's going to happen. It's not happening now. Daddy's going to take care of business. Let's go. And he jacked his life up. And today we are living in turmoil across the world because Abraham just couldn't wait a few more years. 
And isn't that how it is in our life? Isn't that how it is in our businesses? Isn't that how it is in our family? Isn't that how it is in our heart? That we know God says something, but we can't wait, and so we try and jump out and do it on our own, and it ends up, always ends up, being a mess. The thing that I see in this story in the Apostle Paul of after three months that we can apply is God's going to do it in your life, but it's going to take time. That son that you have is, who's far from God, he's coming back to God in Jesus' name. For God is not willing that any should perish, but that all might come to repentance. But you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to be patient. That, that the financial situation in your life, it's going to change because God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. But you're going to have to be patient. You're going to have to wait until God says go, until God brings in the ship. But when he brings in the ship, you go. But until then, be patient. So let me ask you this today. What is it that you know in your heart that God would have you be a part of or God wants to do? Are you willing to just wait? Just be patient. Just wait for God. And in the meantime, just put your heart into the things that God's placed into your hands now. Just put your heart in the thing he's placed in your hands now, and then just wait. Are you willing to do that? If you are, you're going to be like Paul, and soon the ship's going to come in, something's going to turn. If you're not, you're probably going to be more like Abraham, and it ain't going to turn out too good. Here's the fourth thing that I see. Excuse me, the third thing. It says, so now Paul is in Rome, and it says three days later, he just lands in Rome, and three days later, he called together the leader leaders of the Jews. And when they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people and against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving of death. But when the Jews objected, I compelled and appealed to Caesar, Caesar not, uh, not that I had any charge or, or to bring against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and to talk with you. It is because of the hope of Israel that I am bound and with these chains. And they replied, we, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And none of our brothers who, who have come from, from there has reported any or said anything about you. But we want to hear what you have to say. For we have heard of these people everywhere. And everyone is talking about this sect of Christians. And they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. And Paul begins to share the gospel with these Jewish non-Christian leaders. Now let me ask you a question. When Paul was back in Jerusalem, what was it that got him in trouble? Sharing Jesus with non-Christian Jewish leaders. That's what got him in trouble. What is it that God told Paul to do. Share Jesus with Jewish non-Christian people. So God gives Paul an assignment. I want you to share Jesus with Jews and Gentiles. Paul shares Jesus with the Jewish people in Israel and goes through two and a half years of trials and tribulations, literally. Shipwrecks and court dates. It's been a mess. When he finally gets to Rome, what's the very first thing he decides to do? Where are the Jews who don't know Jesus? I'd like to meet with them. As soon as he lands in Rome, he is proactively stepping into the thing that God called him to do. He sees an opportunity and he proactively seeks it. He's in Rome now. And as soon as he lands in Rome, he says, where are Jewish non-believers? Bring them to me. And when they show up, they say, we've never even heard of you. We've never heard of this problem. If Paul would not have asked to see the Jewish leaders, the Jewish leaders would have never known Paul was there. They would have never heard about Jesus, and they would have never come to Christ in Rome. But be because Paul, when God opened the door, he proactively did what God told him to do, people's lives begin to change. Now, what does that have to do with us? Best example I can give is this. 
whenever I was in the eighth grade, I know I don't look like it now, okay? But whenever I was in the eighth grade, I was about, by almost my height now, and I weighed about 110 pounds, and man, daddy was, I was two things. I was all nose, number one, just a big old, you know, puberty-driven nose, just a huge nose. And the second one was, is I was really fast. It's, man, I, I'm telling you, I was like Forrest Gump. I can run. I was fast. And I was a running back. And as I was a running back, uh, my coach, we ran some certain plays. And we had a couple plays where I like to run the sweep around the outside because I was only 110 pounds. I don't like to run up the middle. <laughs> that kind of hurts a little bit. So we ran some sweep plays. And we had some big linemen. And the play was to go like this. I pull out, they, 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 they pitch me the ball. As they pitch me the ball, two of our biggest linemen pull over and they pick up the defensive end and they pick up a, 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 a cornerback over here and they hit them. And as they hit them, they drive them and the big old hole comes up and I'm, I run through the hole and I could run forever. Here's the problem though. I remember being in a game and hut one, hut two hike and off I go. The ball is pitched to me. I see them pull, boom, linebackers hit. I see them pull, bam, cornerbacks hit. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness, there was a hole so big you could drive a semi-truck through it. I mean, it was massive. And whenever I saw that hole, what did I do? I kept on going to the sidelines to try and I run around the corner of the cornerback, to run around the, the hole. Because I was afraid if I go into that hole, what if they, what if they can't hold the blocks? Linebacker and cornerback, boom, crunch city. And I saw my hole. I had the opportunity. And I didn't take advantage of it. And I ran around the corner. And what happened? I got tackled for a loss. And I got benched. And they put somebody else in the game. And I'll never forget what the coach told me. He grabbed, this is back in the day when coaches could get physical. Okay, so he, without, you know, political correctness and stuff. Coach Daney grabs my face mask. And he says, Kevin! We designed that play for you, and those linemen, they blocked for you, and they gave you a giant hole, and you're not even brave enough to run through it. I'm not going to give you the hole anymore. Get on the bench. Basically saying this, I set it up perfectly for you. I gave you the opportunity, and you didn't take advantage of it. So now I'll let someone else take advantage of the blocks that I'll set for them. When the Apostle Paul lands in Rome, God opens the door and he reminds them there's Jewish non-believers here. The hole is wide open. All you got to do is make the phone call, man. All you got to do is get the word out and you can run through that hole and you can do what I called you to do. And Paul took advantage of it. And in your life today, the thing that God has called you to do, eventually, the door's going to open. Eventually, the phone call's going to come. Something's going to change. And in that moment, when you land in your room, in that moment, when you get that, in that moment, when you see it happening, you have to be a man of God enough and a woman of God enough to be proactive and pursue it. Even knowing that it might hurt, even knowing that it might not work like that, even knowing I've got a chance to run now, I'm going. And so many times what happens in our life is God pulls and he blocks for us and we've got the opportunity to change our finances. We've got the opportunity to take that financial peace class and we say, ah, I don't know. No, 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 that's your chance, man. You got that opportunity to go to that uh, uh, marriage retreat. Ah, I don't know. No, no, that's your chance. Go. Your marriage will get better. Door swings wide open and a friend asks us, what do you think about Jesus? And we say, I don't, I don't know. Sip the coffee and go. No, no, that's your chance. You get the opportunity to get the raise. You get the opportunity to have the conversation. You get the opportunity to start serving the ministry. You get the opportunity to make a difference. When God gives you the chance, when you land in your Rome, run. Run. Be proactive. The most amazing thing to me about this whole thing is that whenever Paul's talking to these Jewish people, he's thinking they've heard of him. They're like, we don't know who you are, bud. We've never heard of you. We don't know of you. And if Paul wouldn't have ran, if Paul wouldn't have sought them out, nothing changes. It's the same way in our life. There is a raise for you that's coming. And God's going to open the door for you to work hard and go get it. 
But you got to work hard and go get it. There's a job out there for you to have. But you're not going to find it in grandma's basement playing video games. You got to get up and go get it. You got to check the one ads. You got to get online. You got to knock on the door. Your, your, your son's going to come back to Christ. And you got to patiently wait. But when you get that opportunity and he starts to ask a question, you got to not shy away from it and think, I don't want to offend him because what if I share Jesus with him or invite him to church and he gets offended? But what happens if you don't? Run into the hole that God makes for you. And again, I think all of these points are so applicable, no matter what area of life that you're on. We don't make the approval of men our motivation. We make His approval our motivation. We know that God's called us to do something, but we've got to patiently wait for Him to open that door. But when He opens the door, I'm running. And I'm proactively seeking it out. And the last thing that we see is this. Verse 31, it's the last verse in Acts. It says, boldly, boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. It says that Paul continued on in his house where he was a prisoner for two years, boldly and without hindrance, boldly and all out, preaching the good news of Jesus. And I think that those should be at the end of our life when someone stands up and they explain who you were as a person. What I want my one of the things I want my children to say is is my dad ran hard for what God told him to do. Oh, he messed up sometimes and did stupid. Yeah, he wasn't perfect. Man, he ran hard. I think as Christ followers that God has called us to be the example of how life should be lived in his families. The example has life should be lived as parents. Examples how life should be lived in the business world and in the educational system. We are the light of the world. And so because of that, we have to shine boldly and all out, boldly, holding nothing back. And the reason that we can do that is, is because we don't really care what they think. We care what he thinks. The reason that we can boldly live and without hesitation move forward in our life is because we know we're going to patiently wait until he opens the door. But when he opens the door, it's because I can run through the hole and I'm going to run. And I'm going to make that phone call. I'm going to make that change. I'm going to do that thing. I'm going to start this over here. I'm going to stop doing this over here. But I'm going to go all out. And there's far too many times that we as parents and family members and business people in, the, in this world that we as Christ followers, we have the opportunity to do something. We have the opportunity to go and it's a God mandate and it's a good thing. It's going to make the world better. And we just say, I don't know. No. These people in the book of Acts, they were ate up with God. They were ate up with this call. They were ate up with the mission of Jesus. And I think that we as modern day Christians, the Acts 29 Christians, I think we should do the same. I think we should serve the audience of one and not care what they think. Don't be rude, don't be brash, but I'm not trying to please you. I'm trying to please him by winning you to Jesus. I'm going to patiently wait, but when God gives me the opportunity, I'm going to be proactive. And once I get it, I'm going to go all out. And again, as the band comes up, I don't know how you apply this to your life. I don't know. I don't know how Anthony applies these four things. I don't know how Tom applies them. I don't know, I don't know how Ralph applies them. I don't, I don't know how Juan applies I don't know how you apply these things, but I know they're in the Bible because God wants you to apply them. So today, in closing, let me ask you a couple questions. How many times during the week do you really, really concern yourself do they still like me? Are they happy with me? What do they think? How many times a week is that your motivation? Towards what you wear, towards what you drive, towards where you spend your money, towards what you say. If you're trying to please them this last week, get ready for next week. Because they might not even like you. 
And it's not even on the, it's just, that's just life. It's just life. It's up and down and in and out. How much of a motivation is their approval? Secondly is, how patient are you? How many times have you just kind of went too fast? You stepped out too soon. You made that call when you shouldn't have. You made that change and, yeah, oh, man, looking back, that was a, whew, that wasn't God's time, it was me. And this is the hard thing of when do you know, that's a whole other series, when do you know it's God's time and when do you know it's not? I think that God makes it really, really obvious at times. Paul didn't have to wonder if it's time to go to Rome. A ship pulls up and the centurion says, get on the boat, that's ours. He, he knew it was time. And I'm praying that for you, whatever it is you're waiting on, that all of a sudden, like me playing football, there's going to be this hole that's wide open. And you're going to know, this is it. But here's the thing. you got to be ready for it when it comes. And when it comes, be proactive. I, I don't know why, but I think there's people in the room in certain areas of your life. You've landed in your room. Something could change very quickly. But you have to take the next step and you're still waiting on God to move. He's already moved. He, you, you landed in Rome. You have the chance. You, you, the, the tides can turn, but now it's your move. And he won't move again because he's already done his job. And again, I don't know how you apply this. But I think if we will, I think if we will live for an audience of one, I think if we'll patiently wait for him to open the door, and when he opens the door, we boldly and without hesitation run through it, I think that's when we'll become the light of the world. I think that's whenever we'll be a city set upon a hill and we'll walk in a room and people will say, hey, that's, that guy's a Christian. And things will start to change. So I don't know how you apply it, but my challenge is to you today, start. Serve him, be patient. When he opens the door, run through it. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. We know that this message today is esteemly extremely simple. It's not overly spiritual, but Lord, on the other hand, it is. These simple things are some of the hardest things we can do in our life is to not care so much about do they really like me? God, help us to be motivated that we are already loved. We are already accepted. We are already being changed into the likeness of Jesus. Help us to know that, God. Help us, God, that because of that, it changes us to be patient but it also changes us to be motivated to change what you say to change. If there's things we need to stop, we stop. If there's things that we need to start, we start. But God, help us to be like the Apostle Paul, to play for the audience of one, to be patient in our life. And when you open the door, we boldly and without hindrance run. Run the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. In Jesus' name we pray.